All right. So folks, we're going to get started with our second panel here. Uh, how does central party control in Congress affect the legislative process? In Federalist 10, James Madison elaborates on the problems of faction, noting that the causes of faction cannot be removed, but that the effects of faction might be ameliorated, either by majorities overruling small factions uh, or by the structure of a constitutional republic. For example, by the size of the legislature relative to the number of electors, um, and by factions being unable to effectively organize in a large nation with sprawling territory. Have we checked faction? Many have lamented our two-party system, some asserting that the rise of parties perfectly destroys our constitutional system. Others have decried the rise of partisanship, particularly in Congress. Uh, some say things are too slow. We've had a large number, for example, of, of stalled or substantially delayed or failed federal court nominees in 2018, for example. Others say that things move too fast. Uh, and where does party leadership fall into this? Why do rank and file members provide information and control to Senate leadership, for example, when 60 years ago the bread and butter of Senate committee chairman's power was what happens in committee stays in committee? What role does leadership play in keeping members chained to the fundraising conveyor belt, for example? So uh, we're going to talk about a lot of different issues uh, here, but uh, we're so fortunate to have with us today three real experts on these issues. Uh, on the theory and practice of the legislative process and the role that party leadership plays in that. So uh, I will introduce them now uh, in the order in which they will speak. First we have uh, uh, James I. Walner, a senior fellow at the R Street Institute, he, uh, where he, he researches and writes about the theory and practice of democratic politics uh, with an emphasis on Congress. And he's also a lecturer uh, in the Department of Government at American University and a fellow at its Center for Congressional and Presidential Studies. He's the author of two books, uh, and he received both his doctoral and master's degree in politics from the Catholic University of America. Uh, next, we have Frances E. Lee. She's a professor in government and politics at the University of Maryland. Most recently, she's the author of uh, insecure Majorities, Congress, and the Perpetual Campaign. Uh, her work has received national recognition, including the American Political Science Association's Richard F. Fenno Award for the best book on legislative politics. Uh, all right. And finally, uh, we are pleased also to have uh, Christopher J. Barkley. He's the policy director for Senator Mitt Romney, and he has long uh, tenure here on the Hill. So we are quite Pleased to have someone, uh, our sole panelist right now, who is actually involved in the thick of uh, dealing, I think that's a nice neutral word, dealing with party leadership and dealing with the uh, individual member concerns. So uh, thank you very much. I'm pleased to have all of you, and we look forward to the discussion. So James? And I'm talking. Oh, yeah, we go. Oh. Good morning. Um, thank you to the uh, Gray Center and thank you, Andrew. And it's a pleasure to be here. And this is a fabulous uh, discussion and a, and a wonderful panel that we just heard from as well. And I look forward to, to hearing from the one that, that comes next. Um, my name is James Walner. I typically have lived at the intersection of theory and practice. But I must say, now that you have uh, my fellow panelists here, I'm not sure what I'm going to add to the uh, equation because we have both theory and practice and probably better well represented on the other side of the podium here. But I will, uh, I'll do my best. And as I was thinking uh, through things and listening to the first panel, I was reminded um, of the Russian general, the Soviet general in, in Hemingway's uh, For Whom the Bell Tolls, I think uh, General Goltz. And he tells uh, Robert Jordan, Hemingway's protagonist, I never think, do not try to trap me into thinking, right? And I want, to, I want to try to trap us into thinking this morning. I want us to start thinking. I want us to ask questions. I want us to kind of look at the contradictions. And I want to try to tease out the implications. Because I think a lot of what's happening now is that we're not necessarily thinking clearly about Congress and about our politics. And I also want to kind of throw a provocative uh, claim or argument at you right now, right at the beginning, which is that Congress is incompatible with how we think about politics at present. Just as incompatible, doesn't work. 
And I think the reason why, and teasing through and working through that, shows why we have centralized party control today and, it, and how it relates to the legislative process and a lot of the dysfunction and gridlock that we see in Congress today. So to do that, I think I want to, what, I want to talk about four things. What we think is happening in Congress, what is really happening in Congress. I want to then consider why it's happening. And then I want to talk about what can be done about it so that it doesn't happen. And to kind of orient our conversation is, is during the break, we were told to look at these fabulous portraits and, uh, or murals on the walls here. Um, but my eye was drawn to the, the great seal behind me. And on the great seal, you see the phrase or the motto, e pluribus unum. It's a wonderful phrase, our de facto national motto, motto out of many, one. It's incredible, 13 letters. 13 letters tells you exactly what the American founding was about in its twofold nature. One, you have 13 separate colonies declaring their independence from Great Britain. And then they join together to form one nation out of many, one, right? But it also means something else, and I think something much more extraordinary. And it means that in America, at least, we have freedom, not tyranny. Everyone is a ruler and everyone is ruled. By extension, no one is ruled as a subject. And American, the founders weren't the first to think about this, right? I mean, the ancient Greeks got this. They called it isonomia, or equality of law, political equality, equality before the law. Isegoria, or equality of speech, free speech. The Greeks thought about this. The Athenians thought about this. They used it to describe their system of government and to differentiate it from the other tyrannies in the other Greek poleis in, at the time and from Persian despotism, of course, with Xerxes and Darius. But they had this idea, political equality. It's important. It's good. We want it. Problem was, they didn't know how to keep it. They didn't know how to secure it. And that's what makes the, the phrase on the other side of the Great Seal, which we don't see, I think, so extraordinary. Novus ordo seclorum, a new order of the ages. What makes the framers so unique is that they cracked the code. And, we, and I think Federals 10 and 51 are great examples of this. But they cracked the code. They realized how to keep political equality. And they saw that the space in which politics occurs is vital for that to happen. And when that space collapses, then political equality, isonomia, goes away. And I think that's what we're seeing today. And that's what I want to talk about. So there are two views we think about politics in terms of in two ways, both inside the Senate and inside the House and in our society writ large. One is in terms of progress. Look at these pictures on the wall. 19th century, progress. We're going towards an end. It's rectilinear. You've got a railroad over here with a bunch of Greek gods. I mean, it's two very bizarre things juxtaposed with one another. The inevitability of progress, of knowledge, the application of expertise to solve society's ills. That's how we think about it. I don't care if you're a conservative or a liberal, a socialist or a libertarian, it doesn't make any difference. We think about politics today in terms of means and ends, in terms of a, a Congress is a place where you go to build widgets, where you go to realize truth. And that's basically, I mean, that's the kind of common thread, right? And I'll talk about the implications of that in a, in a second. We, but that's not how the framers thought about it. Remember, they thought about it in terms of space. They, taught, they thought about it as the ancients did, in terms of forms of government. And when you think about it as a form of government, and you think about political equality and, and sustaining it as a form of government, you begin to think about the activities that go on inside those forms. The activity is important. It is crucial. And so when I think about Congress, I don't necessarily think about rules being good or bad, as they, whether or not they hinder our action towards some preconceived outcome that I want, or whether they stop it, right? And you can look at the debate over the nuclear option these days on this very this basis, right? Republicans say Democrats are terrible for using the nuclear option. Then they turn around and use the nuclear option. They're not being hypocritical. They have a different end in mind. It was terrible for the Democrats to use it, and vice versa. Both sides think the same way about politics. That's the problem. So, but that's not the point. You have regular order. You have irregular order. There's no one way of doing things in Congress. It's going to change, and it always will. What matters is the activity. The underlying nature doesn't change. The activity is constant. But today, we think about it in terms of progress. And today, the activity gets in the way of progress. The uncertainty generated by the activity, the unpredictable nature of political activity when equals get together, 
right? You can't control it, that's bad, right? It makes progress more difficult. So we, we have a hard time relating to Congress. So let's think about political action here, right? And let's think about the structure of Congress and how it makes decision, decisions in this context. So there's no one right way to structure or lead Congress. It changes. In the Senate, for instance, of the 1950s, Lyndon Johnson led Congress differently, led the Senate differently than Mike Mansfield led the Senate in the 1960s. It changed, right? It's not like you can come and like discern the one true way and once you've got that knowledge, you can then impose it on the institution and it'll work. It's going to constantly react to its environment. So today we have strong, cohesive parties and strong leaders. That's the way we think of it. But they don't act that way. And that's the interesting thing, right? We think about it in means and ends, we miss this. But if we think about it as, a, as an institution where action occurs, the question immediately becomes why aren't the parties acting like we think they are, they should, right? Acknowledging this makes it easier, I think, to understand why we have centralized control, right? And this makes sense. Usually we think of strong parties as arising out of agreement. You don't need parties if everybody agrees. You don't need strong leaders if everybody agrees. Parties arise, especially in Congress, to solve what we call the social choice problem. They arise because there's disagreement. And they have to deal with that disagreement in a way that emphasizes the agreement between partisans so that they can then form an effective long coalition, right? So they can win more than they otherwise would win. Disagreement is why we have parties. And when parties disagree, they give power to leaders to keep the issues over which they disagree off the agenda. So that makes sense. So the first thing is we have this idea of strong parties today, but my argument is it's not because they agree on everything. In fact, it's because they disagree on everything. And then the question becomes, well, what's really happening, right? Why aren't they acting at all? Right? One, hand, one answer is that they, they disagree, and I think that's part of it. But it's also because the way they think about politics has shifted, and this gets back to this idea of progress. One of uh, Mitch McConnell, at least when I was here, one of his favorite sayings, he would always say it in lunch, winners win, losers lose. Winners win, losers lose. It's a tautology, right? I mean, like, yeah, I get it. But it's actually a very insightful kind of statement that opens us, uh, gives us a way into the thinking right now in Congress. Winners win. What he means is people who win elections win policy. People who lose elections lose policy, right? Remember, if you think about progress and Congress is a place where you build widgets, you then think of it as a production process, not a legislative process. And a production process is something you control. And you need to control the means of production to build the widget. So how do you do that? You win elections because the means of production are votes, they're members, they're gavels, committee chairs, fundraising dollars, go on down the line, right? So you have to win elections. Winners win. Winners shape policy. Policy is made in elections. It's not made in Congress. It's about progress. And to, prog and to progress, you have to win. Well, that's problematic because you're divided, remember? Let's go back to this idea of why parties are divided. Don't not. I mean, why we have strong leaders? Because they're divided. So we have this situation where you, even when you win, you lose because they never act. You're sitting around waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting and Godot literally never shows up. The Republicans are going through this right now. They've been waiting for a better part of a decade in the last two years. So far as I can tell, they just confirmed a bunch of judges, right? And so the question is, it doesn't act like what's actually happening. We have this irony of centralized control, but inaction, right? You control the means of production, but it's still not good enough. But that, I think, helps us understand why we have centralized party control today. So the question is, well, what can we be done? What, what can we do about this, right? We can't impose some sort of standard from the outside. That's not gonna work. That would destroy political equality. It would, it, but that's in line with progress, right? Let's figure out what the answer is and then we'll set the rules and everything will be great and we'll all progress there rationally. But that's not what it's about. It's about an activity. It's about equals coming together to resolve their differences on the basis of equality at its very basic in some form about arguing, about persuasion. It's not about the application of expertise. And so if you change the rules and the structures, you're not going to change anything so long as we think about Congress in this way, so long as we think about politics in this way. We need to think about the space where politics occurs. That's important. We need to recognize that action generates conflict, and conflict is a good thing. Conflict makes compromise possible. Hannah Arendt, uh, the political theorist, talks about the boundlessness of action. 
When you act into the world, you create possibilities that didn't exist before. You create webs of relationships. You make new things happen. Others react to you, and that's how compromise happens. I often say this, compromise is impossible without conflict. Think about that. Compromise is impossible without conflict. Consensus isn't, but that's not what political equality is about. Political equality is about conflict. It's about disagreement. It's about resolving those disagreements as equals. And so we need more action to open up more possibilities. The rules matter, the structures matter, but we need to understand the structures that we have. And we, and we need to understand them in terms of allowing legislators not to act. They punt things to the executive branch, to delegate to the executive branch, precisely because they're divided on these issues. They punt things to the judiciary for the same reason. Kirsten Gillibrand goes to the floor last summer. She gives a very impassioned speech. And these are, they're all good people, and they're doing the best they can. I firmly believe this. But they think about it differently, as do we. And she gives this speech where she's talking about the, the situation at the board of the crisis of migrant uh, women and their mothers and children, and they're being separated. And she's, and she's tearing up, and she's talking about darkness falling, and this is a terrible thing. And I take her at her word, and she's banging the table. And she says, we must act. We have to act. And if the administration won't do it, Congress will do it. She gives a great speech. At the end of it, she says, please co-sponsor this bill with Dianne Feinstein and myself. And then she leaves the floor. Not once does she try to offer an amendment. Not once does she object to a unanimous consent request to get leverage to force that issue. Not once does she try to act in the Senate where you would pass that bill. Why not? Because she wants to be president. That's fine, because she thinks presidents act. Winners win. Presidents act. You win elections. You don't win in the Senate. You don't do anything in the Senate. And so you have, and that's the kind of environment in which we exist right now. And, in, and it's not going to change until we recognize that action is a good thing and conflict is a good thing. Um, in kind of conclusion here, I don't want to go on too long, I'm reminded of a, another quote, John Adams in his defense of the Constitution of the United States. He says, it is action, not rest, that constitutes our pleasure. And then the, the last thing I want to say is, to go back to Mike Mansfield, because if you think about it, the Senate of the 1960s, the 1960s in general, I mean, it was a, it was a terrible time, right? I mean, you have all of the pro, these protests, you have the Vietnam War, you have, in, I mean, all the way through the early 70s, you have assassinations, you have Kent State. I mean, th I mean, think of the conflict. This place would just blow up on the spot. It couldn't deal with any of it, right? Somebody disagrees over what your favorite color is today, and it's like, we can't fund the government because there's a disagreement. We have no idea how to resolve it. Right? This is a serious time. And Mike Mansfield comes into it, and he realizes that the trick to facilitate compromise is to let go, not to try to control it, to let people resolve that conflict. Because if they don't resolve it in con Congress, where else are they going to resolve it? That's the reason why we have Congress, to fight, to vote, to disagree, to take votes, maybe to lose, to win, to try, whatever it is they want to do, not to judge it according to some standard that we pick from the outside and impose on it. And he wants to give this speech, because nobody likes Mansfield at first, right? He makes them work. Like, these guys don't want to work, and he's making them work, and they don't like it. And, it, and, and, and political action is not fun. It's uncertain. It's a bad thing. It's frustrating. So they don't like it. And he gives this speech, but he was going to give it when, when Kennedy was assassinated. And so he puts it in the record. He's too torn up to give it. And he says, it will be of no avail to install a time clock at the entrance to the chamber for senators to punch when they enter or leave the floor. So it's not a factory. You can't judge it by some like, preconceived standard that you're imposing on it and evaluating its output. The thing that matters is not the output, it's the action. And, he's, and it's a nonsensical to judge the Senate by some outside standard because it, it's not a factory, and, and Mansfield's not a factory foreman. He says, he rejects the idea that he's a circus ringmaster, I'm quoting him, a circus ringmaster, the master of ceremonies of a Senate nightclub, a tamer of Senate lions, or a wheeler and dealer. He says, the leadership wields no whip and seeks no whip to wield. Why? Because the leadership isn't in control. And today, we think about politics in terms of imposing control. So is it, it, and it's like, well, we need to control things. So centralized leadership is a thing that is needed because it can make things happen. Or we don't like this centralized leadership, so we need our own centralized leadership to make things happen. Or they're doing it, so we have to do it. 
But that's about progress, and it's not about progress. And as long as we think about that, it's never going to get any better. It just won't. So what I, again, going back to Hemingway and this fabulous kind of exchange between this Russian general in, in Spain in the 30s and, and Robert Jordan, this American professor from Montana, I think of Spanish, I never think, do not try to trap me into thinking. There are no easy answers. I don't have the answers. But what I think we can do is to point out the disconnects, point out the contradictions, and then we can start wrestling with them and trying to figure out how to solve them. Thank you. Thank you, James. So, uh, Professor Lee? Is it working now? OK. All right. Uh, I, I see there's a, a light, but it doesn't light up. So, <laughs> um, so thanks very much to, to Adam and to Andrew and to the Gray Center for organizing this conference uh, and, and these super interesting panels and for inviting me to participate. So the question for the panel today was, how does central party control in Congress affect the legislative process? And so I just want to start out by saying that there's no doubt that power in Congress is far more centralized in party leaders than it was in the 1980s and the 1990s, much less uh, you know, compared to the 1960s and 1970s, the, uh, the, the comparison points that um, James was just drawing our attention to. Party leaders take a far more central role in negotiating legislation. Important legislation today is frequently negotiated in leadership offices behind closed doors. Work done in committee is regularly redone by leadership interventions in later stages. Committees are bypassed altogether on a regular basis. Examining patterns in news coverage over time, I found that journalists much more frequently turn to party leaders for comment on legislation compared to practices in the 1980s and 1990s when committee chairs were more often the ones quoted in the news stories about congressional action. It is sort of just understood today that party leaders are where the real action is now. Now, I don't think anyone would defend these processes on the merits, since I'm saying that Congress works better this way, that the older, more decentralized, committee-driven process is better capitalized on Congress's strengths as a deliberative institution. Centralized processes don't allow much input from rank-and-file members in the form of open debate and amending. These ad hoc Highly centralized processes don't take advantage of the expertise of committee members who really know the issues. But I don't think it's possible to just to respond to those patterns by exhorting Congress to go back to the regular order, even if the regular order is preferable in theory. Because the reason for the shifts takes root in changed circumstances that are both internal and external to Congress. First, Congress today operates in an external environment of tough, virtually continuous competition for majority control. In this environment, members look to party leaders to take the lead on managing the party's common interests in winning and maintaining party control. That um, winners win and losers lose point that, uh, that, that James referenced, that that's a preoccupation for congressional leaders today because the, the environment is much more uncertain than it was during the long era of the seemingly permanent democratic majority of the 20th century. For both parties, this means that members expect their leaders to organize and to steer party messaging operations. They want their leaders to coordinate them in advantageous talking points. They expect leaders to set up roll call votes that will help the party put its opposition on the wrong side of public opinion. Both parties employ large teams of professional staff communicators whose job it is to help drive media coverage that's favorable to the party. For a majority party, these competitive electoral circumstances mean that leaders have strong incentive to suppress or keep off the floor agenda issues that um, divide the party internally. Leaders will tend to block legislation if it is opposed by significant elements within the majority party. This is true even for bipartisan legislation that could gain a chamber majority. This is not just a matter of the so-called Hastert rule, where leaders are expected not to move forward on issues where most of their party disapproves. In fact, that's a pretty low bar for leaders. 
Party leaders tend to uh, want to avoid issues that upset any significant bloc within their party, even if that bloc isn't actually a majority of the party. Leaders don't always succeed in doing this. Just in the last Congress, leaders moved forward on a highly divisive immigration debate uh, due to minority party and uh, presidential pressure to, to take it up, despite a lot of incentives not to proceed on that issue. They also advanced the First Step Act for enactment, even though a quarter of the majority party opposed it. But this pressure to avoid issues that divide the majority remains a real constraint. Looking inside the institution, leaders now operate in an internal environment where if they try to have an open process, it's exploited for partisan messaging. Committee markups and open floor proceedings create opportunities for obstructionists to throw a wrench in the works. If you try to work through an open markup on the bill, it can get weighed down in partisan attacks and nothing happens. So faced with these prospects, leaders often opt for tightly managed processes. Party leaders often would like to, to have a more decentralized process, provided they can get to some kind of outcome, some kind of result. But when a decentralized process can't get to a successful outcome, leadership intervenes. Leadership also steps in in crisis situations, when the House and Senate are at loggerheads over must-pass legislation, or when the minority party is blocking with a filibuster threat. Leadership has to step up to resolve the problem. No one else is in a position to do it. Centralization in leadership has some bad effects on legislative problem solving. But we have to ask, what's the alternative to it? The old decentralized processes don't work as well under today's circumstances. The pressures both inside and outside the institution are different. So, but as we take stock of these changes in the legislative process, I want to draw attention to two effects that centralized leadership have not had. First, there are not more laws enacted today on party line votes. Congressional lawmaking is still almost always bipartisan. Today's Congress does not enact more laws on party line votes than that of the 1970s. Even today, most legislation, including most important legislation, passes with majorities of both parties in favor. This was true of most of the laws passed in the 115th Congress under unified party control. After Congress passed the First Step Act, reporters everywhere were writing about this as a rare bipartisan success. Senate Majority Leader McConnell's spokesperson had finally had enough of that, and so he tweeted out, rare? <laughs> Maybe you missed. Opioids, water infrastructure, aviation infrastructure, farm bill, drug pricing transparency, veterans bills, safe medications, banking reform, preventing sex trafficking, longest S-chip extension in history, school safety legislation, appropriations. And as a matter of the data, Don Stewart was exactly right. Even though the parties have polarized in Congress, there has been effectively no change in the frequency with which the majority party legislates over the opposition of the minority party. Most laws enacted today continue to attract significant minority party support just as they did 40 years ago. A second change from centralized party leadership that has not occurred is that it's not resulted in majority parties that are better at enacting their policy priorities, you know, in, in, in pushing uh, you know, the production that James was referring to. My co-author, Jim Curry of the University of Utah, and I compiled a list of all the majority party agenda priorities for each congressional majority party going back to the 1980s, mid-1980s, the 1985. To do this, we would read the opening speeches given by the Senate Majority Leader and the Speaker of the House at the start of the Congress and make a note of any policy issues that were flagged in those speeches. We also looked at the bills that were inserted into the leadership bill numbers, so the, uh, the re leadership reserve bills, the H HR 1 through 10 generally in the House, S 1 through 5. This yielded a list of 265 majority party agenda priorities over our period. We then constructed legislative histories of each of these agenda items, asking whether the majority party got most of what it wanted, whether it got some of what it wanted, or it got none of what it wanted on those items. 
We found that 48 percent of the time, on average, majority parties in Congress fail to pass legislation on their agenda items. So failure is the most likely outcome in any given Congress, and there's been no significant trend over time. Party leaders today are not much better or worse than leaders in less centralized times at shepherdizing, the, it's shepherding, shepherding their party priorities to enactment. The second most likely outcome, that this is 30 percent of the time, so 48 percent of the time failure, 31 percent of the time on average over the period, is the majority party got some of what it wanted, but it had to compromise on key items in order to get the bill through. The least likely outcome, only 20 percent of the time, was a clear victory, where the majority party did most of what it set out to accomplish. Clear victories are more likely in unified government than in divided government, not surprisingly. But even in unified government, failure is more likely than a clear success. Our next question is, when looking at those cases where the majority party succeeded in either getting some or most of what it wanted, how did it do so? The answer to that question is that it's very unusual for a majority party to enact one of its agenda priorities over the opposition of the minority party in both chambers. The far more likely way a majority party succeeds on its agenda items, and this is almost 80 percent of the time, so out of 80 percent of majority party successes, are achieved with the support of a majority of the minority party in at least one chamber of Congress. Since 1985, we found only 12 majority party agenda items on which a congressional majority party got most of what it wanted and did so over the objections of a majority of the minority party in both chambers of Congress and over the opposition of the minority leadership in both parties. So Obamacare and the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act from the last Congress are not the model for legislating even today. These are very rare. They were two of the 12 cases since 1985. So laws passed without significant, in fact, you know, majority support from the minority party in at least one chamber rarely occur even today. So we still have a compromise-inducing political system, one that in most all cases requires bipartisanship for success. It's particularly true under contemporary conditions where the two parties are evenly matched in electoral strength and therefore have to share in power. Bipartisanship is how things get done in American politics today, just as it was in the past. In most cases, the alternative to bipartisanship is just gridlock. The centralization in leaders hasn't changed that. So the political incentives make bipartisanship really difficult, much harder to achieve, but it's just as necessary for legislative success as it uh, previously was. Thank you. And last, we have um, Chris Barkley from Senator Romney's office. All right. Thanks a lot. Appreciate uh, the Gray Center for inviting me. I also thank Adam and uh, Andrew for uh, navigating this panel for us. And it's, uh, it's a treat to be up here with James and Francis. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach. I still work here on the Hill. Um, so I know that uh, James and I were colleagues here on the Hill for a long time, so he probably has a lot of the same experiences as me. But wanted to kind of um, share a little bit, because I've worked in a bunch of different positions here on the Hill. Um, been fortunate to work in the House and the Senate, in members' personal offices, in committees, and most recently in uh, a leadership office here in the Senate. Current job puts me in the role of overseeing Mitt Romney's policy office, um, their policy team. Uh, but just prior to this, I was the policy director for what is called the Senate Republican Policy Committee, or RPC. Um, you might not know RPC, but it's the fourth ranking leadership office here in the Senate on the Republican side. And its basic job is to help educate members and staff about what's going on here in the Senate and uh, help them provide information to their teams. Um, I guess I should add before I say anything that anything I say today is my own thoughts and not Mitt Romney's thoughts, but I don't think uh, uh, I'll say anything overly controversial. Um, so the question asks, how does centralized party control affect the legislative process? I would argue that here in the Senate, uh, party leaders provide members with three things, structure, information, and time. And these are things that they value highly, and uh, 
party leaders provide these to the members. And this uh, explains at least a non-exhaustive list of some of the big things that party leaders provide that members want and sort of why we see what we see today. Uh, so whether or not these produce the right kind of legislative outcomes, I'll let the bigger brains on the panel uh, navigate through that, and I'll just kind of provide my experience, what it's like working here in the Senate, and uh, a lot of it focused on my time in leadership. Uh, so let's start with structure. Um, probably goes without saying, senators are busy people. Uh, everybody's busy, but the source of a senator's busyness is really having a foot in two worlds always at one time, one here in D.C. and one back at home. And uh, it seems like no matter where a senator is at any given time, they're very urgently feeling like they need to get back to where they just were. So, uh, you know, they need to be constantly on airplanes, and that is just the life of uh, an elected official here in the Senate. Um, so keeping track of their time requires every senator to hire at least one scheduler, sometimes two or three. Um, it's a pretty big job. And the requests for meetings are endless. Um, and saying yes to even a fraction of them would occupy literally every second of every day. And that's before any of the real work that comes with being a senator. Committee meetings, writing bills, debating legislation, um, not to mention campaigning, raising money, and meeting with constituents. Um, so let me give you one of my favorite snapshots in the life of a busy senator, as it was told to me by a friend uh, who worked on the Democratic side of the aisle some years ago. During a vote a number of years back, um, the late Senator Frank Lautenberg found Senator, former Senator Ted Kennedy on the floor to talk about a bill, and he pulled out a pocket card, probably like this, I'm sorry about that. Uh, members like to carry these pocket cards around. They feel very good if they hand a pocket card to another member on the floor and explain what they're doing. And so uh, he held this, uh, Senator Lautenberg came up and held this up to Ted Kennedy, he said, uh, I'm supposed to say these things to you. And uh, Ted Kennedy, realizing he also had a pocket card, pulled out his pocket card, handed it to Lautenberg and said, I I'm supposed to say these things to you. And so they exchanged cards and uh, resumed chatting about whatever it was that had brought them together in the first place. And so, you know, it was just a good reminder that they're busy. They're trying to get things done. And with so much on their plates, they crave structure and order. It's otherwise a very chaotic place to be here in the Senate. And so party leaders give them that on both sides. And it's a real service to members that they, pro they value very highly. The average senator's work week looks something like this. On Monday evening at 5.30, they head down to the Senate floor for what's known as the comeback vote. Traditionally, it's a non-controversial vote meant to get everybody back into town and see who's here. Uh, it gets set up the prior Thursday by the majority and the minority leaders, often by unanimous consent. Um, this is not something that is pre-checked with all the other members, but it's something that they arrange uh, so that it sets up the next week. Tuesday morning, maybe around 11.30, they vote again, head to the party lunches, which start at 1 and go to about 2.15. The lunch on Tuesday is run by the chairman of the Republican, uh, Republican Policy Committee, which is where I used to work. Uh, so that's a member of leadership. More votes on Tuesday afternoon and Wednesday morning, announced by the Whip's office. And then comes the next day's party lunch, uh, the one Dr. Walner used to run when he was here, uh, here in the Senate. And that's also from about 1 to 2.15, possibly a few more votes after lunch into the afternoon. Thursday, more votes around 10.30, have a quick lunch, head for the airports after a vote at 1.45. So members rely on that schedule as they plan out their weeks, and they know that with few exceptions, that's pretty much how it's going to go. Uh, they don't necessarily know what they'll be voting on from one week to the next, but they know the general schedule. Second. That brings me to the way party leaders serve their members in another way, with information. The Senate, in particular, is a small place. All day, every day, senators are talking, trying to figure out what's going to happen and what everybody else is thinking. Every member is like a little squirrel, constantly hunting for pieces of information and hiding it in a tree, hoping to use it later. But good information is hard to come by, and so those who have it are endowed with a certain amount of institutional power. There's no better source of information than the four leadership offices, and really, the majority leader's office is the richest source of information of it all. What do these offices know that the other members don't necessarily know? The timing of votes, the subject of votes, the whip count, the private concerns of other members, special communications from the White House, what the other party is saying in private. In short, a lot of really helpful stuff. Uh, leadership shares that information with members in a number of ways. One is at the party lunches that I just mentioned. 
at the Tuesday lunch, the majority leader will go first and give everybody a game plan for the week, probably three or four minutes. It's often one of the most important small segments of time in the entire week for a lot of members to know what's coming up next. Next comes a report from the WIP, the conference chair, the policy chair, the vice chairman of the conference, and the head of the National Republican Senate Committee. Something similar uh, happens at the lunch on Wednesday. Um, another way, information is given by leadership staff to the staffs of every office. And this is part of the process I was uh, more firmly part of when I was at RPC. On the Republican side, which I can speak to from experience, the week starts out with a lot of meetings. There are separate meetings every Monday for uh, staff directors of each committee, the legislative directors, the chiefs of staffs, and the communications directors, all hosted by leadership offices. Throughout the week, leadership provides other services as well. RPC will send out policy papers for legislative staffs. The, uh, the conference, which is a messaging operation, will send out messaging advice to communications directors. And the majority leader's office sends out hotline notifications to every office. If you don't know what these are, they let people know what bills and resolutions members want to pass, um, often seeking to do so by unanimous consent after having been cleared uh, through a committee. So all of this information filters back up to the members who are not only told about what will be voted on, but also given detailed background information on every bill, amendment, and nomination that is about to hit the floor. So to be sure, every member relies on their own staffs to make a judgment about how to vote. But I would hardly, so I'd hardly want to leave the impression that senators are just taking from leadership and just doing what they say. But I can't stress enough the importance of party leaders in providing essential information to senators as they navigate everything that's in front of them in the Senate. So finally, I'll close by noting that um, party leaders help members save a lot of time. So you can imagine that's a, that's a well sought after commodity. The legislative process is slow, frustrating, and usually pretty boring for most members. Um, and the absolute last thing senators want to do is sit on the floor all day and listen to their colleagues yammer on about whatever it is that they want to talk about. Um, and so without the organizing function provided by party leaders, they would spend a lot more time doing just that, or else spend a whole lot less time knowing what, in fact, was going on. So party leaders help keep the, same, uh, the Senate's trains running on time, and they do so with pretty remarkable efficiency. Um, as I already mentioned, the two party leaders arrange things so that m members can fly in Monday and out on Thursday pretty predictably. And uh, as I mentioned before, the majority leader will get together on Thursday afternoon or Thursday during the day and figure out with the minority leader um, how much work the majority can get done the next week in a seven day period if every single minute of every, uh, uh, if under the rules, every minute is required to be used. And the majority leader will go to the minority leader and say, all right, here's seven days worth of work. Do you want to do it in seven days or do you want to do it in three days? And if the majority, uh, if the minority is feeling particularly feisty, they might drag that out a little bit longer, but in almost every case, they say, fine, let's do it in three days. And then they figure out a way to structure the week so that things that would normally happen in seven days happen in three days and gets everybody out of here a little quicker. So that means most senators get to spend the remaining days back in their states or out raising money or whatever people do when they're out on their own time, and uh, which is something they either like to do or know that they have to do. And so in the end, time is a resource that can never be reclaimed, and so party leaders giving busy senators more of that is an important job. So wrapping this up, um, I, as I said at the top, I'll leave it to the bigger brains on this panel to decide um, what all this means, but for my part, if asked how all of this affects legislative outcomes, I would simply say profoundly. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, we will have plenty of time for questions. Uh, we will break at 12 for lunch, uh, but I would just like to ask one question, uh, an issue that didn't really come up. Uh, we're very privileged here to have uh, former Senator and Judge Buckley in the audience who has written a book on how uh, members of Congress spend an awful lot of time fundraising. And I'm just kind of curious how uh, leadership plays into fundraising, because it seems to me that a lot of what leadership does in terms of protecting marginal members um, 
could be ameliorated if you had different coalitions coming together in the primary process uh, to elect members with deeper support. Um, and it seems like, you know, we know that marginal members, marginal races are the ones where more money is spent. And so presumably they're the ones where leadership has the most role in selecting who the candidate for the party is, throwing their weight behind someone and offering money early is probably very helpful. Um, so they would select, I would think that they would select members that might need their support more, that might, they would select members that are kind of chained to this process of not having votes that have higher risk uh, and that, that might uh, members, they would select members that naturally, maybe they're not thinking of it this way, but that naturally would need to be in their home districts more, fundraising more. Um, the, uh, the, you know, the, the counter example to this is someone like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Joe Crowley. Occasionally you do have upsets. And there was that bit of that tussle after she was elected with leadership that seemed to, she seems to have been brought to heel or whatever. But I am just kind of curious, what role leadership plays? Does that entrench, does that potentially entrench this kind of process? Uh, and I will uh, say, Chris, feel free to punt, so. Thank you. Okay. Like all things, if fundraising can be good or bad, the need to fundraise can be good or bad. I don't think that there's a tension between or they're incompatible uh, messaging and legislating, for instance, right? You can message uh, at the expense of legislating or you can message as a way to facilitate legislating. If you confront an environment inside the Senate or the House that is not conducive to your outcomes, what do you do? You have to figure out a way to expand the scope of conflict to get more people on your side. And the way to do that is to either persuade other people's constituents that, that you're right so that they will support you and so you kind of go out and message and everything else or you um, or you try to get more people to win, right? And maybe you help them raise money, that sort of thing. So fundraising itself isn't, and the need to raise money isn't necessarily bad. Uh, you know, uh, it's not a question of good or bad, it's about action. And what kind of action are we facilitating? And, and that goes back again to legislation or production. If you're doing production, the kind of fundraising that is good to facilitate action is a bad thing. Because as Chris says, you need structure, information, and time. All very true. That's about imposing control on an uncontrollable process. Right? And so, but you can do what AOC does, what Jim DeMint would do very well, what others do. You know the best way to get attention? Pick a fight. You get a lot of media attention. Right? You pick a fight. And they love it if you're fighting your own party. It's even better. And with attention comes what? Dollars. Right? Go down and, and, and try to advance causes so that the people that want those causes will give you more money. This is what the, like, the dreaded pluralists would talk about this in the 50s. And so, you know, my question is not necessarily what's the right way to regulate fundraising or not, or is fundraising good or bad? It's not a question of good or bad. It's about action. And everything we think about Congress, is what I want to stress today, has to be thought about in terms of a framework for action. Is the Reform X going to facilitate or stymie action? And we have to think about it in those terms. So uh, James flagged the uh, incentives of individual members to, uh, to raise money and the techniques that they can use to do so. But there's also the question of coordinated fundraising and leadership's role in that. And that's become much more important in today's environment of uh, you know, insecure majorities, where parties are continually worried about losing their majorities if they have it, and the out party is looking for a way to get back in. And so that is one of the factors creating so much in, you know, inflation in campaign spending, that you've got outside groups that are directing money into the races that will decide uh, which party holds a majority. And leaders you know, ask members to step up and to contribute. And so it, it's, it understood, I don't know the Senate practices on this so well, but in the, in the House there's been a fair bit of reporting about how leaders of both parties expect that uh, members who chair important committees uh, will raise more money for the party's collective efforts than the typical rank-and-file member will, and there's sort of an understanding of, you know, what the, what the dollar amounts should be. And uh, in the uh, 
the hearings that have been held so far this year for the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress in the House of Representatives, number of members came down to testify before the uh, before the committee complaining about these practices. So they don't like the the pressure that's put on them to uh, to to raise money for those for those collective efforts. Leaders are aware of that, and leaders shoulder a lot of the fundraising burden themselves. That's one of the other services that, you know, in addition to all the services that Chris listed, that 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 leaders perform. But I think, you know, we need to understand the pressures that uh, the parties are under under today's circumstances. That. Uh, you know, if we want to understand why the pressure is on to raise so much money, to understand what the stakes are. And uh, with the stakes being party control in virtually every set of elections, then, you know, you've got, uh, you, know, you know, every interest that cares about which party controls Congress wants to, uh, to you know, be able to, you know, uh, you know have an impact. Uh, and that means spending where it can count and directing money where it's needed. Leaders want to get um, want to get that money where it needs to go. They would like to be be able to have good candidates who will win, but there are legitimacy issues with too much le you know of a, you know leadership heavy hand in pr the primary process. So leaders are sort of at the the mercy of that to some extent, and uh, but and have to you know play the cards that they are dealt. But I think we need to think about those pressures in, uh, under the circumstances that are uh, prevail uh, in our current conditions. I'll just give one comical uh, little insight into the role that some of the party leaders play when it comes to um, these kinds of issues. Uh, I've been in a lot of meetings with a lot of uh, Senate Republican leadership members who laughed to themselves endlessly last year when they thought about how big of a problem uh, Senator Schumer was going to have in keeping his people here because of so many of them running for president. And it reminded me of that again today with Senator Bennett jumping into the race and with so many Democratic senators running for president, um, getting them here to actually vote is hard because they're out campaigning, raising money, and running for president. And it's a related but somewhat different issue than what you're talking about there. But um, they know that it is very difficult to get everybody here to vote, um, especially when the Democratic members don't want to be here voting on district court judges and associate or assistant secretaries of commerce, um, and they'd much rather be in Iowa and New Hampshire. And so uh, the party leaders play a pretty, uh, especially on the Democratic side right now, a central role in trying to block out that time, and that's a lot of why um, Senator McConnell can pretty easily count on them not wanting to drag proceedings into the weekend right now, um, because if we want to get out of here, they have a much bigger incentive to want to get out of here. All right. Uh, we'll go to the audience for some questions then, please. We have a few mics that are coming around. Oh, sure. Right up in the front. Uh, Elaine Middleman, this is just a really simple question. When you talk about the scheduling votes, why is it that they have to be physically present and they can't do voting when they're out in Iowa or something? Is there, is there like a law that says that or is it just some It's in Senate rules right now um, and that they have to be physically present to vote. And, um, you know, I think that probably is pretty good practice generally um, just to keep them here and talking about things in person. But, yeah, that's a Senate rule. I'm not aware of proposals to change it. Um, I think it... There would probably be some pretty big downsides to it, um, but um, no one would ever be here. Yeah, I don't think they would ever show up. They just text their vote in, I guess. Or <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great question. And from a deeper theoretical point, it gets, it just undermines the entire purpose of, of why we have politics, yeah. right? The whole thing is none of us are able to impose our truth on everyone else because we're all equal. So therefore, we have to come together, as Socrates would say, and argue and share our opinions and hopefully through that process transcend them and grasp some sort of truth as it pertains to the public sphere. And if you're all doing that from the comfort of your own home, I mean, I guess you could argue with virtual technology, but in reality, that's not the way it's going to work. And that's why deliberation is so important and arguments are so important. And that's why centralized control, I think, doesn't produce. I mean, Francis is right. They do build widgets. They're just, their widgets are not very interesting, right? 
They're not building widgets over things that people want them to build widgets over. And if they built widgets like this in the 60s, they wouldn't have built the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, and so on. Being here is important. And Ted Kennedy captured this very well in his memoir. It is a terrible book, as most member memoirs are. But it's called True Compass. And there's the best description of the Senate I've ever read in this memoir. And he calls it a chemical body. And he says it's a chemical body. It's not a physical process. It's not governed by the laws of production and everything else. It's a chemical body. And something happens when all of the members get in a room together and they realize they're not going home till they get something done. That's when the magic happens, right? And you have to have that happen. And if you vote remotely, that won't happen. Part of why I said today was when I was walking over here, I was thinking about Senator McCain when he went, and that's going to be played forever probably. And I, I mean, I can't speak for Senator McCain, but I'm sure he knew that his gesture, the way he did it, was very, you know, photogenic and would be memorable. And obviously, if he was in Iowa or Arizona or something voting online, that wouldn't have happened. So. <laughs> I was on the floor during that, and it was 3.30 in the morning, so I think everybody in the room was pretty delirious. <laughs> I just have a question. Um, you know, based on Chris's framework, where he said central party leadership basically provides three things to the members. It was, right, it was inf information, structure, and time. And of course, sort of along in there also is financial resources and messaging resources, right, communications. Well, just sort of situating it in the current moment where you have this unsettling of some of the traditional political coalitions within parties, it's just this, especially as we head into the next presidential primaries, you know, just a slight unsettling of what we used to take for granted within the parties. And also just the increasing power of outside organizations like super PACs and the ability of, of you know, Twitter and Facebook and so on to allow individual members to become much better at messaging outside of all this. So taking all that change together. I'm just curious, for the other two panels, uh, Jane, uh, panelists, James and Francis, what do you see going forward? Right, we've had this entire discussion about what, what has happened and what we now have with central party control. Do you see any prospects for significant changes to what we've discussed in, in the, the near or medium future? Well, uh, changes have to come from members being dissatisfied that, you know, the dissatisfaction in the broad public with congressional performance would only drive change internal to Congress if members of Congress agreed with that sort of public verdict or believed that change, you know, internal changes would help. That, so it, we really rely on their perceptions. Um, my sense is that members are pretty satisfied with the uh, internal operations. Of, of, the, of the body. That's especially true in the Senate, that um, we've seen some shifts in um, making the Senate more efficient in handling nominations, but so little interest in doing anything to change the way the Senate handles the legis legislative questions. That, that to me speaks to a, um, uh, an important reality which is that uh, you know, the Senate, Congress generally, it's true of the Senate, um, is, you know, serves members' needs as they perceive them. And so if leaders are, are doing what members need them to do, and they're, they're, they're satisfied with the operations of the chamber, then I don't think you'll ex we should expect to see large-scale changes. Um, and my sense is right now, on the whole, they are satisfied. Um, on the, uh, you've got in the House that Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. It's considering some reform. But the effort to, to bring that Select Committee about was not from leadership, more from backbenchers, more from people who are somewhat dissatisfied, but it's a small faction. It's the you know, problem solvers group. It's not the, the, the mainstream of either, you know, of either party. Uh, and so and until you, you, know, you get a critical mass of members who want change, then I think we'll continue on status quo. I, um, yeah, I think that's right. I, uh, well, I'll just talk and hopefully you can hear. Um, but I'm not, it, it, 
satisfied, but satisfied in comparison to what, right? I think that's, that's the key thing. And this gets back to, again, the shift in how we think about Congress and how, it's, and, how, and, and, and how that governs and drives things. So I don't think that many members are happy right now. In fact, so far as I can tell, pretty much everybody in the Senate and pretty much everybody in America seems unhappy. I don't know. I mean, can, does anybody know someone who loves the status quo? Right? It's pretty as a rare feat in and of itself. Um, but the question is, why doesn't it change? And I think it's, again, because the things that it's taken to change it are, whether it's how Congress operates or in terms of policy, we see as the problem. 1958, you have 12 senators, liberal northern Democrats, come in. 12. That's a, that just the universe that shift changes everything, right? I think it's 12. Maybe 13. I'm pretty sure 12. And Lyndon Johnson can't run the Senate the way he used to because the Senate changed. And then he left, and so now we talk about him as if he was the master of the Senate. He stuck around. We wouldn't talk about him that way because he couldn't lead the Senate that way. My guess is the Senate would look a lot like it does today. Mike Mansfield comes in. He has a humility. It's his genius to recognize the Senate has changed, and he has to lead it differently, right? So he changes what he does. He changes, or at least, what leaders do. And then you have one of the most explosive periods in lawmaking in American history, right? He embraces the conflict. He leans into the punch, whatever the metaphor is, right? I mean, that's what he does. In 2010, you saw something somewhat similar. You had a lot of conservatives coming into the Senate, in particular from this Tea Party wave. And it, it rocked the Senate's world. Trust me, Chris was here, I was here. It rocked the Senate's world. I mean, it went up, it cut cap balance. It went right up to the debt ceiling deadline. You had all of these threats of government shutdowns. You had a literal government shutdown over Obamacare. It took a long time for the Senate leadership and for the establishment, and I don't use these words in kind of sinister ways, but to get a handle on the situation. Several years. And I think what's really telling is between 2010 and 2016, there was a really big fight in the Republican Party and in the Democratic Party within the, comp in the Senate and the House to a lesser extent. And that fight was over whether or not action was good or bad. Democrats handled theirs much better than Republicans. Republicans didn't handle it in the most secretive manner. Um, I was involved in many of those fights. But the result was the same. Action is bad. There is a new norm in the Senate today, and it's a norm of inaction. The leadership won that. Members now, rank and file, all the way down, think that if you act, then you're going to undermine your ability, as Francis said, to win elections. And you have to win elections to win policy. The problem is they don't even agree on policy. So it's like, what's the point? But nobody wants to do that because they're like that Soviet general who sits around saying, do not trap me into thinking. It's uncomfortable. I don't want to do that. Winners win. They don't think. Go right here in the middle to. Oh. There we go. <clears throat> I, I'm uh, James Buckley. Uh, about uh, 40 odd years ago, I was in the Senate, and I'm just st standing up and not to ask any questions and so forth, just to make an observation. Everything you have talked about is totally strange to my experience. We were, the work of the Senate was scheduled five days a week, and there was enough work left over that you went home, which was in Washington, D.C., with a full briefcase trying to keep up with the work that's going to face you the next week. Uh, we were working around the clock, but here, we were not spending most of our time trying to get reelected. We did that every sixth year, some with better success than I had. Uh, on the question of money, uh, I never picked up a phone to ask for a dollar. When I ran as a third party candidate in 1970, uh, there were peculiar situations, and the message I had seemed to have some resonance. Uh, I had a campaign finance chairman. He found the money. Uh, and um, most of it came from small contributors by mail. Uh, in 1974, the <coughs> Senate saw fit, Congress saw fit to pass the, to my mind, disastrous Campaign Finance uh, Reform Act of 1974, which for the first time placed limits on what you could have in individual contributions and started triggering the problems we have today with PACs, 
gave, basically created PACs as a source of money and converted uh, members of Congress into uh, uh, people who have to spend two, three, four hours a day, I'm told, uh, t telephoning, begging for money. Uh, and th that rule was in place uh, in 76 when I ran for re-election. Uh, but I still didn't pick up the phone. Uh, I didn't get re-elected, but not for, because I didn't have sufficient money to, to uh, run a, a decent campaign. So in terms of the problems that we face now with, in my view, a dysfunctional uh, 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 <coughs> Congress, I wonder if we don't have to think once again on whether or not the business of members of the Senate is to be in Washington most of the time, except in election years. Um, you all are the experts, so I'll pass, pass that on to you all. I, I would just say in general, you're right, and I think institutions are, they die the second the action that created them no longer it ceases, right? That's, and that's where you get this great, you can have great change without any outside happenings. This is why the Roman Empire fell. It didn't fall because of debauchery and immor immortality. I mean, the Roman Im Republic, I mean, the Roman Republic, not empire. The Republic was not exactly a virtuous place, right? It fell because people had just stopped thinking that what the Republican institutions did was important. The idea that the Senate and the House or that Congress itself is going to be important when its members no longer think that it's important, that it is an important place where important decisions are decided, right? When that happens, then what, like, what's the point? The only thing that different, like, differentiates us from Rome is that we have a constitution, we wrote it down, it's still there, we have it, we talk about our politics as if it was important, but our activity doesn't affirm that belief. And so, again, and things aren't going to change until members say, you know what, yeah, you have to win elections and you have to do all these other things. But they're all steps that you have to take to be able to get to this place to win over policy. It's, that's, this is where you act. You don't write op-eds about how we need to redefine conservatism when you're a senator. You don't sit around and lecture your colleagues from the dais about what's the, what the problem is and what needs to be done. You do it. You participate in an activity. And it seems to me that the senators that we have today don't think that activity is important. So it should be no surprise that the Senate is not important. And that's, I think, the fundamental point. And until we acknowledge that, we can't, we're not, no amount of rule change is gonna fix it. Well, you know, Congress, Congress, has, Congress has changed, but it's a representative body and those changes to a great extent reflect you know, different expectations that constituents have. You know, in the you know, now the era of jet travel, constituents expect their members to be back. So even if, even if we were to uh, make it easier for members to afford uh, you know, a, 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 a good place for their families here in Washington, they wouldn't move their families here because that's not what constituents now expect. They want their members to be back there. Public attitudes towards the institution of Congress are reflected by members. That so when you hear, you know, if you hear and what James is pointing to, I think you know that's, it's a reality that if you hear Congress being devalued in members' rhetoric, that reflects public perceptions. That members members of Congress come out of the public and they reflect it, and so. You know, a lot of the changes that we we can point to come from those changed uh, expectations at the constituency level, and it's very hard to you know, those can't be addressed simply by changing the, the the members unless the public is the one doing that. That it's not it's not something that that um, can be engineered through internal rules in the uh, House or the Senate or campaign finance rules that it, the, 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 these expectations take their root in what the public wants from representation. And they want to see their members. And they want them to be present. And they don't want them to feel that they're distant from them in Washington, DC. Uh, and so we now inhabit a world where every member now is a member of the Tuesday Thursday Club. We used to talk about in the 1960s, 1970s, there was a handful of members who were Tuesday Thursday members. Now they all are. But that, that reflects what, they're, what they see their constituents wanting from them. All right. So uh, 
we started off uh, today with a panel basically saying that you know we need to the administrative state needs to be fixed to fix Congress. Congress needs to be fixed to fix the administrative state. So I don't know which way out of it. Maybe that'll lead into our third panel. But we are going to break a little early so that the caterers can set up our lunch. So please join me in thanking our panelists.